but I'd like to say that I could use my outdoor voice, but I don't think that'd be very effective here. So hopefully we'll get that microphone issue uh, worked out. Representative Bingham, Representative Gildenkamp, Hunter, thank you both for taking time to join us here to talk about this topic. Thank you, uh, let, me, let me make sure that's on there for you. Okay. Well, it's interesting that uh, we even start this conversation here that uh, <laughs> Can they turn your mics off at the General Assembly? Yeah. Do they do that? Do they do that? <laughs> What's interesting is that uh, both of you have been uh, involved in the General Assembly for many years, uh, have differing viewpoints about this subject that we're talking about, uh, but have worked very closely together on a number of issues. I mean, when we talk about the partisan divide over the issue of poverty. Representative Bingham, let me start with you. Uh, is it as stark as we are led to believe when you read headlines from the Pew Center saying, you know, Republicans have a different view of poverty than Democrats do? Do you think it's that bad at the State House? South Carolina ranks near the bottom in child poverty. That was the, the headline that came out this morning in the newspaper. One, you work in a high poverty, persistent poverty county there in Orangeburg. A lot of what you do outside the General Assembly is dedicated to social service type work. Why should we care that uh, South Carolina ranks so high in child poverty? Well, Mark, first let me say thank you to the Riley Institute, to you, and to all of you who have come out here on a Tuesday evening to listen to two politicians. Uh, <laughs> both Kitty and I are just thrilled to see this room full of people. And we also want to acknowledge our colleague, Representative Chandra Dillard, who is in the back and doing a great job here in Greenville County. We ought to care about the fact that the children's, um, ch children's count, South Carolina numbers that were released on Tuesday, say that our state ranks 45th in child poverty. That's important because children are going to grow up to become adults. Children in this state who are poor at some point are going to be responsible for taking care of us, hopefully in a meaningful way. So, oh, praise the Lord, thank you. <laughs> some of y'all might be Sorry that uh, <laughs> we got these. Okay, I guess we can get rid of that, huh? Yes, ma'am, we did. So we ought to care because this is America. It's the greatest country in the world. We say we are the land of the free and the brave, and we are caring and compassionate. And so we ought to care because we're Americans, and Americans care. At least that's what we claim. Well, Representative Bingham, let me ask you about this. When we talk about young people, and, and Gilda, you didn't really expound on this too much, but I want to talk about this cycle of poverty, this cycle of once you are in poverty, I always like to say being 
poor is dangerous to your health because so many other bad determinant outcomes will happen over the course of your life. It's very difficult to break free of there. Uh, when you look at these numbers and you look at the number of kids that are growing up in poverty at this particular moment, um, when it becomes a political football, as it so often does at the national level, at the state level, is that disturbing to you as, a, as an elected official? No, it's disturbing to me as an elected official, as a father, um, as a person that um, cares about other people. I mean, you know, that's a fundamental. I'm a very conservative Republican. I'll put that out there. At the same length of time, I think you have to understand the balance of what we have going on um, in our economy and in our society today. I remember back, and, and all this ties into the poverty level, um, back in 1996, I ran for school board. Uh, it's the first time I'd ever been anything in elected um, arena or try to run for public office. Really had never given it much thought before. Um, I'm a civil engineer by nature, and civil engineers, we go to school and we believe that there's an answer for every problem. And you can solve it and you can come to a definitive solution. Now, that does not always work in politics. Uh, there's certainly many shades of gray, and there's not a definitive solution. And so you have to learn to adapt. But I remember very specifically how ignorant I was um, back then in 1996 as I was running for office because, I, you know, you hear about um, education and heard about a lot of the problems with disruptive students in classrooms. And my philosophy was, and I said it very clearly on the stump, I said, look, if we've got kids that are being disruptive in the classroom, we just get, need to get rid of them, take them out of the classroom. We need to get them out of there. And that sounds good, and you hear a lot of people do that, and that's really what I thought and believed, uh, but I was, thank the Lord, smart enough to look at figures and numbers. And once I was elected to school board and got on, then you start looking at numbers and looking at Then you start understanding that, wait a second, now we can take these kids and we can remove them from the classroom and we can kick them out of school. But then what we find is, is that the overwhelming majority, 70, 80 percent of those students are going to find themselves into our prison system. And then when you look at the economic cost of having to take care of them in a prison system and what that does to society, then real quickly we figured out that, look, we need to do something. And we did. It was a 4-3 vote. We created a charter school for, uh, or a magnet program inside of our school for kids who were very disruptive. And here's the unique thing. We were fortunate that we have an empty school um, that had been, a new school had been built. That school was empty. We took it. And in each classroom, we set aside um, a place for four students. And so if a student was disruptive in a classroom, then they were sent to the alternative um, education center that we had created. It was one of the first in the Midlands. We sent them there. One teacher in that classroom with four kids. Now, that's a lot of money. However, when you looked at the impact, it was really astonishing. It took not more than a few months, and you start going in, and you hear the stories of these kids. And what I found out and what we learned is that these students who were disruptive, 75% of those students were disruptive because they had fallen behind. They could not read. They could not catch up, and they felt like they could not participate in class. So when the teacher asked them a question, they did not want to feel stupid, and they did not want to acknowledge their ignorance, and so they would cut up, they would misbehave, they would do something to get removed from the environment because they felt like they would be embarrassed. And nothing changed my perspective more than watching these students that was in this classroom. You're not going to save them all. I mean, there's, there's kids that are just that way, and some of those are going to fall away, and that's unfortunate. But a large portion, 75% of them, that once they got in this environment, they did not want to ever go back to their public school, their normal traditional high school again for the first time because if they were in the 10th grade but reading on a third grade level, we backed it down to third grade. And we taught them third grade and fourth grade and fifth, and they felt successful. They felt like they could participate. And that was a huge learning tool for me, and it helped shape my perspective very early on in my elective career. And I've tried to carry that with me, understanding that, number one, I really don't know the answers to all the questions, but I need to do a lot of research to try to find out. So from that, Dr. Hennessy, thank you so much for your presentation tonight. It was wonderful. And it certainly provided us a lot of valuable information. But number two, you understand that even being conservative and thinking you're not going to spend any money, you are going to spend money. And so what we need to do is make sure the money we spend is the most effective way and that we get the desired result. Because there's nothing greater than watching these children who have not been successful in a school environment all of a sudden become successful. It's like the adult education graduations, Mark. I mean, some of the greatest things that ever take place is watching these adult education graduations. When I find that, that's one of the best events to be to because people who have ultimately succeeded in life. It's probably a longer answer than you wanted, but you got politicians. What do you expect? <laughs> because I see Gilda here, you know, shaking her head and I think whispering, like, the man can talk, can he? <laughs> see, he can. Can he very well spoken? But, but your larger point about what Mr. Bingham was saying is what? Well, the larger point.
point about what Kenny is saying, quite frankly, is when we talk about children, we talk about education, we've got to drill down and understand that this zero tolerance policy, for example, uh, that he mentioned, we are pretty much criminalizing discipline in our schools. And what that, in effect, means is we are perpetuating the school to prison pipeline. And when I say criminalizing discipline, let me give you a quick example of what I'm talking about. We all, after um, those shootings and Columbine and all of that, are very concerned about school safety. We all want to make sure that our kids are learning in an environment that's safe. And so most school boards, most school districts have created policies that uh, we can label zero tolerance. No weapons, no nothing appearing to be a weapon coming into schools. And so you have instances where, for example, if a kid uh, gets into a, a fight or, or there was one case that I thought was really crazy where a, a child brought a butter knife to school and wound up being suspended. Kenny's point about suspensions and in-school suspension and whether or not we are really creating a larger problem than we think when we automatically suspend uh, kids from school is something that we need to take a look at. Because when you drill down and look at the data, what it shows is that in school suspensions or all of these zero tolerance policies for the most part are having a disproportionate effect on children of color, black, brown, Native American. And what the studies further show is that when you start suspending kids in school, what you are doing in effect is subjecting them to a life of in and out of the prison system, in and out of our social service systems and all of that. So I think when we talk about education, we have got to understand, and it kind of goes back to the point, to the question you asked earlier, why we ought to care. We ought to care about kids going to jail because guess what? They aren't going to be there forever. Even with mandatory sentencing, they are eventually going to come out. And if we continue to focus on warehousing as opposed to rehabilitation, then we are not doing ourselves a favor. Final point on this whole notion of prison, uh, school to prison pipeline is that all of us, in my view, ought to be concerned when we care more about building prisons than we do about building schools. That says something, I think, about us as a community and as a society. Prison ought not be economic development. Oh. <laughs> One of the, the more inspirational people that I've ever run across in state government, a man by the name of Judge Bill Byers, who both of you know, Judge Byers was a family court law judge in Camden, uh, was eventually named to uh, take over the Department of Juvenile Justice. For those of you who don't know, there was a time when South Carolina's Department of Juvenile Justice was actually run by the federal government because it was so chronically mismanaged. It was warehousing students. It wasn't rehabilitating. It wasn't preparing them for a real life. And Judge Byers told me one time, because, you know, when I took that job, you know, I was told to, to get it going. I was told to get it out of the federal hands so it could be a state-run agency again. He says, but what I really did is I sat down and I thought long and hard about what this should look like. And he goes, far too often in our state, we have the rhetoric of caring about our neighbor. We're a Christian culture. We're a church-going people. But what about looking at these young people in the eye and going, what you so do unto the least of these? He thought, that's the only way that I approach this job. And he said, that's the way I wish more people in state government would approach their job. Either shut down the rhetoric or close the gap, because far too often in this state, the two don't match up very well. Does that ring a bell to you at all, Mr. Bingham? I think it does. I mean, you see it every day, and a um, couple of interesting points along those same topics, and um, Dr. Hennessy even uh, mentioned it earlier. I don't know if you caught what she said um, when she was talking about the Federal Poverty Index. She said that that rate had not changed since its creation, and one of the reasons why is that it's just so difficult to change. And I want you to think about this. How many times have you voted for a politician that did not run for change? The answer is probably none. Have you ever heard a politician take this stuff and say, look, I want you to vote for me because I'm Mr. Status Quo. I'm not going to do anything different. 
I want to keep everything just like it is. You're not going to vote for that person, and they don't run. But yet we vote for change, but you know what the really reality of it is? We don't want change. We want change to be everybody else is affected, but not me. That's the change we want. We want everyone else to do like I think they should be doing, and so we vote for change, but we don't see it happen because it's very, very difficult. People don't, innately, we all are that way, we don't like to be changed. And unless change takes place, we cannot really move our state forward to the level that we need to move it. Um, some of us, um, myself, Representative Cobb Hunter, and others, we like big issues. We like a challenge. It's not always popular, but we like them because that is the only way. That's the reason I ran for office. I did not run for any other reason, quite frankly. I like the big items. I don't like the little things. I don't like the insignificant bills. I like dealing with major complex issues. We worked on retirement issue together, um, re overhauling our state's retirement system. It was not popular. A lot of people very upset. They did not want change, but it had to happen. The same thing here, Mark, when we're talking about whether it's education, Judge Byers, what he did inside the prison system. He was a maverick, and he was um, taking things and changing them. What Representative Cobb Hunter talked about earlier, about do we really just want to house these people? Is that really giving us a desired result? The answer is no. We've got them there. What are we going to do in order to rehabilitate them so hopefully they'll be productive, producing members of society whenever they exit? Some never will be. We get that. And, and you're not going to always hit those edges. But the, the vast majority in the middle, how do we move that marker? How do we use your tax dollars, our tax dollars, the most effective way in order to get a positive result for all of us? And they should be measured outcomes, measured results. Like I said, I'm an engineer. I like facts, figures, numbers. I loved your presentation because of that. Um, but that's what should be driving decisions. And a lot of times it means we have to change. We cannot keep it like it is today and expect a different result. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Society has changed. Technology has changed all kinds of new avenues that we can tap into if we will, but it's not going to be easy. And the public has to be educated. They have to feel comfortable with those people making those decisions. And right now, there is a lack of trust, probably for a lot of good reasons, between the um, public and the leaders that they elect. And we live in a republic that is required that you trust your elected leader because they're supposed to go educate themselves and make decisions. But because there is no trust, there's a loss of trust between the two, it makes this system of government very hard and almost dysfunctional, and that is why we see dysfunctionality in Washington, D.C. today. Let's talk a little bit about early childhood education because the stat about uh, where South Carolina ranks in poverty right now also highlighted the fact that 57% of our preschool-aged children are not receiving any type of preschool education at all. You don't have to be an expert in early childhood education to know that that is a big issue in a globalized economy where there is so much competition that any child that's just entering kindergarten cold at the age of five with no preparation has a huge word gap that they're probably always going to be behind the rest of their peers. That should concern us more than anything. Is there something we can agree upon in the General Assembly that will somehow expand this coverage of education to children who really need it in these impoverished counties where there's marked by persistent poverty? And Mark, I'm pleased to say that that is an issue that the General Assembly has uh, reached an, an agreement, uh, both Democrats and Republicans, as far as early childhood, pre-K, four-year-old kindergarten. And I add a caveat that those of you who are educators, while we can applaud the notion that the General Assembly has agreed that 4K is important, please understand that that is not even half the battle. There is so much research out there, 20 years old, that suggests zero to three are you know, the formative years and where we need to focus. Unfortunately, those of us who serve in the General Assembly who agree with that position have not been able to convince the majority of our colleagues that while 4K is great, and yes, we've done a good thing by doing that, we are missing a golden opportunity by not focusing on zero to three. Now, there are pockets where there is evidence that we kind of get it. And let me give you an example that may be uh, familiar to those of you here in the Greenville area, something called the Nurse Family Partnership, a wonderful program that started here in Greenville that has now spread to 26 counties in this state where a nurse comes in, works with pregnant women, talking to them about parenting, 
reading to their children, all the kinds of things that some of us who grew up in a two-parent home and take for granted, what we fail to realize is that there are a lot of moms to be out there, mainly teen moms who don't have that foundation, who don't have that kind of environment. So that's one example in addition to 4K where we as a legislature have said, we're going to put our money where our mouth is, and we put money into the nurse family partnership to allow it to expand. We have put money in 4K. It was a tougher fight, Mark, than it should have been to fund 4K. And while I applaud that, I'm waiting, Kenny and I, for our colleagues to get on board and understand the importance of the zero to three because that's where you get the biggest bang for the buck. That's where you're going to make the biggest difference. And until we do that, we really aren't going to see the kind of gains that we would see if we were to fund it. Are you optimistic, sir, that uh, that may happen the next go round? Because you did make a lot of progress in this 4K. The, the research is so overwhelming about that zero to three that Representative Cobb Hunter brings up that you would think it'd be tough to argue against, although I hear people when it's brought up, say, you know, the money's just not there. Or, gee, how are we going to pay for that? Or well, the other side might think, well, how do you not pay for that at the end of the day? Well, I mean, those are all good points, Mark. Let me say this. Um, I'm in a fortunate position. Me and Representative Cobb Hunter both work on uh, the Ways and Means Committee, and so we work together. I actually chair the K-12 um, Budget Subcommittee, so I get to write um, the K-12 budget with my colleagues um, in the House, well, with three other colleagues in support of my other Ways and Means um, patrons. But, um, and we have really focused, and we're all, re all really on the same page with this. Let me tell you what we're trying to do. One key statistic, you can't remember everything, but one thing that I learned back when I was on school board real quickly, and it has followed me through the General Assembly, and it is just a f known fact, is that if a child is not reading on grade level by the fourth grade, he's not going to graduate. It's just that simple. He's just not going to graduate. Uh, but you have to be reading on grade level. I say he's not. 80, 85, 90%. I mean, it is an astronomical percentage. You just cannot do that. So you have to back it up, and you have to get these children reading on grade level. Um, one of the initiatives that we passed, Read to Succeed, this year is to establish that every child is reading on grade level by grade three um, as best we possibly can. And so that is a major initiative that just passed the General Assembly that's going into effect. And that is the reason why, um, and like I said, I'm a very conservative Republican. I've got a caucus full of conservative Republicans who don't want to spend any more money than we have to. We believe in... Uh, uh, free choice and that parents have responsibilities and they do and we'll talk about that in a minute however the same length of time we also have to recognize that these same children if they're not educated and while the parents maybe should be doing certain things that maybe they're not the reality of it is if we don't step in and help then we're going to have the problem down the road we're going to be dealing with that in society and we want to so we're much better off any economist in the world that does the numbers will tell you you're much better off to deal with it in early childhood education intervention than you are at any other time. We're talking about trying to raise up the um, working poor, and the way that you do that is starting at the bottom, and you really have to start with those children. Representative Cobb Hunter is right, but here's what we've done with K-4 um, funding, just to let you know where we're at in this process, is that we started last year funding K-4. We cannot afford to fund all of South Carolina with K-4, and quite frankly, all students don't need to have public K-4. A lot of parents, I mean, their children are doing well, and they train them, or they're in private daycare, they're in private situations. They don't fall into that at-risk category. So in K-4, what we're looking at is at-risk students, students who are at a risk of if they don't get some help and training, they're not going to make that reading um, on grade level by grade three. They're not going to be prepared for school. And so we started last year, and we went to the counties that had the highest poverty indexes, and we funded about half maybe statewide you know i don't can't remember the, the number um but it was about half of those counties this year we expanded it now when we say we're funding those counties the only students in those counties who are going to be eligible for 4k are at-risk students so it's the same poverty child in hampton county or the same poverty condition child that may be in another county we started at the lowest counties trying to raise that up first we're probably two-thirds the way through implementation and if we go lower into three-year-old or two or other programs, I will support that as long as it is a targeted program at targeted individuals. It does not need to be across the board. It does not need to be a mandate. It does not need to be required. But it needs to focus on 
those groups and those demographics that we can get the biggest bang for the buck and where it is cost effective and beneficial. And if it is, that I can stand up and defend that all day long. Yeah, because when you talk about issues like single parent households and, and mandates, then you're mandating to some degree, you're talking about morality. But we also know that if you're born in a single parent household, your opportunity for success, your opportunity for better outcomes is much more compromised than it otherwise would be. So Representative Cobb Hunter, that's a fine line to walk when you say, Gene, we're going to talk about uh, stable marriages. We're going to talk about maybe not having children out of wedlock. And this is what's happening in a lot of our poor communities. doesn't matter what color. You're talking black, white. The outcomes typically are the same. It doesn't matter, you know, where you come from. Uh, how do you begin to have those conversations back home in Orangeburg with folks to say, look, hey, we don't want to really legislate morality, but we do know if you don't take certain steps, your children might not have very positive outcomes. Mark, and just, just a point that I want to make, uh, I'm not sure if I'll get a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Two points. The only important color in America is green, and if you're poor, you're going to catch hell regardless of your skin color. That's critical that we all understand and recognize that. And the other is when we, you can't legislate morality. It just can't, can't be legislated. But quite frankly, and I'm very sorry, but I forgot the question you asked me. I think I don't want. I don't want to let him. He's breathing. The, the fine line there between looking at people in poor neighborhoods and uh -huh. saying, you know, the way out is not the right, way that right. you're taking right now. Right. Well, that's kind of difficult for me. And by the way, I'm a social worker. I work with victims of violence every day. And one of the things that frustrates me so much, both as a social worker as well as a legislator, is dealing with people who have these preconceived notions of what a family is. Uh, they, there are a lot of people who are still in the Ozzie and Harriet days of mom, dad, 2.3, nuclear, two and a half nuclear children. Those days are so long gone. And I'm not, I'm not sure that they're coming back. What I do want to make sure we all recognize is that family is people coming together who love and care about each other. And we as legislators ought not be in the business of putting our own personal beliefs, our own personal morals, our own personal religious uh, stamp on this stuff. As a legislator, it is difficult for me to go into a community and say to a single mom, you ought not be doing this. I want to do that through policies. My job is to set public policy in a way that our schools are educating behavior. Uh, in Orangeburg County, we have something called character, uh, where we go in and into our schools and talk to young kids about character traits and the importance of good character and all of that. So I'm not answering your question because as a legislator, it's difficult for me to see how it is my job to go into a community, a neighborhood, or whatever, and say to anybody, you ought not be doing what you're doing. I am into systems, and I believe as a public official that it is best for me to work within the public policy setting and work with those people who are setting policy and make sure that those kinds of things are a part of public policy. For example, schools, churches. I, you know, there's a separation between church and state. And we all kind of make assumptions that everybody is in church on Sunday mornings. But I would suggest to you that that is also something where the rhetoric is not matching the reality. I just don't know how you do that. But I do know that the best example of how you care, the best example of policy, is where you spend your money. And so whether you are on the local level as a city council a county council, a school board, state government, or the federal government. You can, you can sing praises until the cows come home about how much of a Christian you are and how much you love and care about people. But the best example of that caring is where you put your money. I'm a firm believer that I would rather see a sermon than hear one any day. 
And unfortunately, as Kenny pointed out, when we come to you, we, those of us who are blessed and highly favored enough to be elected public servants, when we come to you and we offer ourselves for service, we don't say we're going to change. All of us are going to change stuff because guess what? That's as he said, that's what you want to hear. But you are not dealing in the reality that most people face. And you're doing a disservice to the community when you allow us to come in with these simple, simplistic solutions for very complex problems. It's not going to work. There is no 30 second sound bite answer to most of the problems that all of us have faced. And I know, Mark, I did not answer your question, but I'm taking cues from my good friend here. <laughs> and when I get the mic, I'm just going to say what I want to say. Thanks. Well, you know, we don't live in a world that really favors the folks who talk in anything more than a 30 second sound bite. We'll make it 15 seconds, really. You know, anything that's shades of gray really aren't rewarded if you want to talk about things that aren't black and white then people start tuning you out and that even happens on an issue as big as health care uh, we have this issue of medicaid in the state the state turning down medicaid money from the federal government but yet we have these two hundred thousand people who are sort of caught in between can't really qualify for the health insurance exchanges don't qualify for medicaid it's a large number of, of residents in south carolina mr bingham and i just wonder you know this has become a political football whether you folks want it to be or not much of that does happen in washington dc but how to rectify that with these being real lives real people who i think many are probably just anxious in some cases desperate just to receive minimum health care how do we bridge that gap in south carolina and keep that from being the political football that it has been well i mean it's a difficult issue when you're dealing with medicaid and you have to start um when you build the state budget, I'll tell you now, I mean, the way that the state budget starts is what is it going to take to maintain Medicaid? Uh, what is it going to ta take to maintain our current Medicaid level um, next year, the same as it was this year? That is the very first building block. And inevitably, uh, that number is the fastest growing number um, of any number that's in our state budget. And as a result, that is the first thing that we fund. Because I can tell you, to try to remove those programs, um, it, it just does not happen. <laughs> It had been tried and tried again um, to disastrous results. And so the um, reality of it is, is that they're not. And when you do go to try to remove a program, uh, guess what? The programs that you can remove are those that makes absolutely no sense in the world to remove. Adult daycare being one of those. You ever go to one of these adult daycare centers? They're where they have um, paraplegic, quadriplegic adults that are still staying with their parents or, or siblings. And while these parents or siblings are working, they take these um, um, children, they, they cannot work or do anything, no, they're adults though, and they take them in these adult daycares and they keep them throughout the day. It's horrendous. Now we can cut that program out. That saved the state a ton of money because all of these could be wards of the state and we would have to pay for them 24 seven. But no, they'll let us cut that program out, but other programs you cannot change. And so when you get down to the alternative programs that we do fund, that you could cut out, we're not going to do it because it makes no economic sense. And, you know, you really would have absolutely no heart in order to do that when you get to these alternative programs. So it makes it a very difficult thing. And one of the reasons why we have not accepted additional Medicaid um, is because of what it's doing to our state budget currently. Um, education funding that we just talked about and the need to in order to provide more it, um, education, especially at the lower levels. Um, education funding is the next thing that's put in the budget, but it's been drastically hurt and cut because of the Medicaid money. It goes to Medicaid first. And you say, was well, that true? Sure it is. Back in 2008, our, per, our base cost per pupil spending, just to give you a, 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 a moniker, was around $2,580 per student. Okay? Whenever we had the recession that hit after 2008, it dropped down to $1,600 per student. Today, it's up around $2,100, $2,200. Now, that's the state funding out of EFA formula. That's not all the money that goes back to local schools or local districts. I'm just trying to give you a relative gauge to go by. Last year, we funded it at $2,200. We're still not back where we were at 2008, and we cannot get there because Medicaid pool has grown dramatically. But what have we done? We have done a lot of good things. We said, look, we're not going to take the federal government's money. Number one, if you checked lately, they're broke. We're in, we're dead. How are you going to say, they say, well, we're going to fund you. We see it every single day. The money doesn't necessarily come, and even if it does come, it's just piling on more and more debt on all of us. And so what we said was, look, 
you know, and they only promised it for three years, and then after that, then we have to start picking up the tab on the Medicaid expansion. Medicaid is an insurance plan. That's really not what we're looking for. Do you really want an insurance plan, or do you want a healthy outcome? Do you really want an insurance plan, or do you want access to care? That's really what it's about. And so what we said is, look, we're not going to do that, but what we will do is this, and we've expanded this plan B that we put in South Carolina. We said we'll do our own, and we have really put a an effort and an emphasis, and a, a lot of money so far, into trying to provide coverage, provide access to care, looking at alternative solutions that are tied to a direct uh, result. Medicaid is not the most efficient program in the world. Look at the fraud and abuse that you read about in the paper every single day. That system needs to be overhauled because it, too, needs to be transformed so that we have outcomes and that the people really get the care they need, not just spending money. And so Medicaid is not the end-all, be-all for health care systems. You don't see private insurers saying, oh, gosh, I really wish I was on the Medicaid plan. Why? Because it's not efficient. It is inefficient. It is not getting the desired results, and you're not getting the type of care that you need. So what we've done is we do recognize the problem of the uninsured. In fact, now, 80, well, I just got some numbers today from Ways and Means. I think it's 81% of that uninsured group in South Carolina, we have now got them on this plan B that we're talking about so that they do have some access to care um, through the programs that we're doing. Are we there yet? Absolutely not. You know, that is, it's a moving target. Every day we try to get a little further. But we're doing the best we can, recognizing the problem, but just not falling in line for the same solutions that really aren't working. I think it's important that we offer a little context uh, on this question. And let me go back to a point uh, that uh, Representative Bingham made about uh, we start the budget off with the health care cost. There's a little something you ought to know about our budget. We start the budget off with providing property tax relief. You need to know that. And I say that particularly in the upstate where that is important. What you need to know is that because the General Assembly has listened to property tax relief, mainly homeowners, over $100,000, we've said it is more important as a state that before we fund education, before we fund health care, before we fund any core service of state government, that we provide property tax. So we've got a pot of money called a property tax relief fund that comes off the top of the budget. Then we spend on health care and all of that. So I need to make that point because for those of you who, who pay attention to detail, that is what I mean about you can say whatever you want, but where you put your money is where your budget priorities are. Now on Medicaid, <laughs> Oh, I didn't say that for applause. I, I really didn't say that for applause. I'm just trying to provide you with some perspective since that is what we're here to do. On the Medicaid piece, it's important for you to understand two points. There are always conversations about fraud, waste, and abuse in Medicaid. And for the number of years that I have been in the General Assembly, long before the Affordable Care Act was even thought about, when our good friend Wick Quinn was um, on his first term, there were a lot of conversations about we're going to save this money through fraud uh, and abuse and creating all these opportunities to catch people for that. Well, here's my point. Riddle me this. Don't you think after 15 or 20 years that we would have weeded out fraud and abuse in South Carolina since that's what we've been talking about? But the final issue for me is this, on Medicaid expansion, regardless of where you are on this issue, if you have private health insurance, what you need to know is that you are paying for the uninsured in this state, period. What you also might want to know is that your hospital is providing uncompensated care for people who have no health insurance. Now, my, my colleagues who are opposed to Medicaid expansion talk about the fact that this is a mandate, that this is a federal program that we are using state government uh, federal dollars. The doctor showed you in her slide 
We are not a donor state. We don't give, we get, okay? Our Medicaid reimbursement, our Medicaid multiplier is 2.47. Every dollar we spend, the feds are 2.47, more than double. What you need to know about Medicaid expansion, see, I don't mind people disagreeing with anything. What I do resent, and I'm not saying that my colleague has done that, I'm talking about people out in the public who just buy whatever they hear on talk radio and on certain networks without checking the facts. And all I'm suggesting to you is that we look at the facts. These are the facts. The federal government for three years pays 100% of the cost of Medicaid. A study done in South Carolina at the University of South Carolina, and I know I'm in the upstate and I'm at Furman, and we got Clemson down the road, but even at the University of South Carolina, they found that if South Carolina were to expand Medicaid, the economic impact would be tremendous, okay? You're talking about 44,000, if I remember correctly, jobs that would be created. Well, we aren't as prosperous in Orangeburg County as y'all are here in Greenville and as my good friend is in Lexington. We've got a double-digit unemployment rate. So we were real interested in seeing some of those health care jobs come to Orangeburg County. After three years, the cost of Medicaid goes down from the feds, but it never drops below 90%. Now, I will ask you this. As, Kenny, as Mr. Bingham has said, you're going to pay for it. You're already paying for it. So you tell me, if you've got an opportunity, let's take President Obama out of this. Let's look at what's on the table. And what's on the table is a plan that was created by the heritage in Jim DeMint from here. Isn't he? Isn't that where he is now? And I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to lay the facts out here for your consideration. You've got a plan before you that was created by the insurance industry, stamp of approval from the Heritage Foundation, all Republicans, and I'm not saying most, all Republicans at the federal level were supportive of it until President Obama adopted it as an idea. Now, I'm not saying that to create controversy. I'm just suggesting to you that when we look at bottom line economics, oh, he's saying the other. <laughs> <laughs> that it makes sense for us to ex expand Medicaid. Final point, even with the barriers that we created here in South Carolina for the Affordable Care Act, requiring navigators to do all kinds of things, do you know here in South Carolina we signed up over 108,000 people? Okay, and do you know that across the country, and I'm sorry, I know this burns most of you to hear this, but do you know that across the country, over 8 million people who didn't have health care insurance now have it? I don't understand why that's a bad thing. I really don't. So I'm for Medicaid expansion. I'm hoping after November when the elections are over, that people will not be as finally challenged as they are now, and that we can go ahead and get it done. You can always speak on it. <laughs> always. <laughs> Representative Bingham, let me talk about just two issues here that uh, do have the effect of lifting people up out of poverty, and uh, two that are, are not currently instituted here in South Carolina. That's the earned income tax credit. It's not physically in our, on our books, and neither is the minimum wage, even though it's recognized by almost all business and industry in the state. But what would the effect of enacting an earned income tax credit in 
So we're having a, a bigger barrier for the minimum wage due for the economy. What kind of side effects might it have? You hear from business and industry, their concerns, or do you think that ultimately it would be a good thing because it would have such a big effect on so many people in our state? Well, you got two different questions. Earned income tax credits, one that um, does have a, a degree of support behind it simply because, and, I, and your slides produced it, I mean, there is some effect to it and because what you're doing is you're rewarding uh, behavior and you're incentivizing behavior. Um, minimum wage, I'm not a, a, a proponent of telling anyone what you have to pay anyone else um, in order to go in business. I think there's cause and effect, and even your slides showed that. The, the numbers demonstrated that. Uh, there is not a, a windfall of agreement. You had 60-plus percent of the money would go to families over $60,000 or something along those lines. And what are those? Those are our kids who work at the various chain restaurants or the food stores or whatever getting um, um, income. And so, fine, if you raise the minimum wage, I mean, it's just an artificial in inflation is what you're doing. It's a redistribution, and it has complicated results as a result of doing that. I think you have to understand where we're at. I believe in a free market society that we try to clearly help those. I believe in trying to help someone, give them a leg up, try to help them out. And as long as they're moving in the right direction, all good and um, well. But just to artificially assign that, you're going to put a number of people out of jobs. Those half million people that's going to be without a job, I mean, that's real to them. That income that they have today, I mean, that's better than nothing that they have today. Um, and so I think that it has a cause and effect that you have to be very careful. There are studies after studies that will, you can get a study to say about anything that you want it to say. Uh, some that say, oh, this would be wonderful if we do this, and others will tell you how disastrous effect it will be. But anytime you start messing in the free market enterprise, there's going to be cause and effect that's going to take place. And so you have to be very careful about saying that you must pay these people that because it is going to affect jobs. The same thing that happened, you talk about part-time workers. Uh, the part-time, a, a number of part-time um, workers have been increasing greatly as a result of what happened with the Affordable Care Act because now they're going to have to provide, if they're full-time employees, now we're going to have to provide health care, so therefore we're going to make them part-time, and your slides themselves show that is one of the biggest barriers to the working um, poor that we have right now is part-time workers, not full-time. The number was 22%, I believe, is the number your slide showed. For those percentage of people, part-time workers are in the working poor. And what affects that? Well, we have the mandates that come down. When you start mandating on private businesses all of these things, while they're wonderful and good and they seem like it, they have a cause and effect on the economy and on society. And then they create another problem that you have to deal with. So you have to be very careful um, at what we do, and that's why I'm not in favor of that. You going to come back at this issue again in 2015? Uh, I intend to not only that, but also the EITC, and I'm glad to hear Representative Bingham say, say that he supported. I'm hopeful that the two of us can, uh, maybe I can get him to join me as a co-sponsor of the Earned Income Tax Credit legislation that I've also introduced for the last several years. I just think it's a no-brainer. Uh, people have got to be able to make a livable wage if they are ever uh, are going to be out of poverty. And this whole conversation about part-time jobs, one of the things that's important to note here is that that slide, the figures as far as part-time employment, those numbers are way before the Affordable Care Act, I would imagine, took effect. And some of them may have something to do uh, with the Affordable Care Act, but I don't buy the argument that because of ACA, it has caused people to create part-time employments, and therefore that's not a reason for us to move forward on insuring people. Well, that's a conversation again for another day, but uh, Representative Bingham, Representative Cobb Hunter, thank you all so much for being with us here today. Thank you We have a couple of gifts that we want to give you. A couple of gifts for you folks uh, to take home with you for taking part in the conversation. Uh, Secretary Riley, President Davis, thank you so much for your presence here tonight. I uh, want to talk about next week, uh, just briefly here before we break. Next Tuesday, our session is going to be with Furman Sociology Professor Kyle Longest and Richmond Deputy Director of Health Danny Avula. Uh, Danny Avula decided to uproot his family, his wife and his children, and live in one of the most impoverished sections of Richmond, Virginia. And his experiences are really, really interesting to hear about uh, what he has observed and how his family has been impacted by living in a high poverty area. So that's going to come up next week. We look forward to seeing you uh, next week with part two of our series, The Working Poor in South Carolina. Thank you again for being with us.